Well, welcome to Paleopedology again. Today's topic is life in Precambrian soils, uh, a topic that's of great interest for uh, trying to figure out whether there was life on Mars as well, because on Mars we have paleosols, as we've seen. Um, and the problem um, turns out to be pretty similar to trying to find evidence of life um, in paleosols on the early Earth as well. We're pretty sure that um, any life that was present in the Precambrian and um, on Mars was largely microscopic. Um, and so it's kind of a challenge uh, with the existing um, rovers that we, that we have. Um, and this is why um, with the Perseverance rover, the latest rover that landed on Mars about a month ago, um, we are going to, ins or we insisted, I was part of the red team planning that mission, um, on sample return. Um, we need to find um, microfossils. Uh, microfossils really have been um, the key to uh, figuring out um, what um, life was like um, on the early Earth um, as well. Uh, microfossils are um, preserved uh, largely in Precambrian rocks um, by uh, permineralization. Um, they are not petrified, uh, but it's a similar process to petrified wood, and you may remember uh, that um, in petrified um, in permineralized wood, um, the cells themselves are no longer alive with nuclei and all that sort of stuff. Um, what's happened uh, is that um, the cell contents have been partly degraded and filled with a mineral. Normally uh, that mineral, the best mineral, is uh, colloidal silica, but it can also be uh, calcite or pyrite. Uh, generally silica is the best one. Um, calcium, CaCO3, is uh, also pretty good. Um, and pyrite, um, also not too bad. Um, this is the main um, sort of um, permineralizing uh, material that we find in beautifully preserved fossil wood, ancient stumps. Um, this is found, of course, in coal balls. We talked about coal balls um, uh, already, um, where the cells are permineralized in um, bicarbonate precipitated uh, in peat. Um, and um, iron uh, sulfide or pyrite um, is um, found in the um, mangrove-like uh, low soils. One of the best examples of um, microfossils in um, permineralized in paleosols uh, is in a pair of paleosols, which I described already, uh, the jewel and the carry pedotype, um, in the feral quartzite. Um, at a place called Mount Grant, uh, which is uh, near the abandoned gold mining town of Mark Goldsworthy, um, which is um, three uh, billion years um, old. And um, these uh, microfossils are quite um, extraordinary. Um, they I did cell counts. They're actually near the surface of the paleosol, uh, in greater abundance than in the subsurface of the paleosol. And there are several um, sorts of them. Uh, the most striking of them are uh, these spindles, which sometimes have what appear to be internal uh, bodies. Uh, and what's uh, striking about them is that they're 50 microns, 50 millionths of a meter um, in length. And um, that's really big um, because um, in rocks this old, this is now we're talking Archean age, 3 billion years, uh, we don't have anything except prokaryotes, which are basically bacteria. We, we have only uh, cells that do not have an organized nucleus, and they generally, uh, these prokaryotic um, creatures, are um, generally um, only a few uh, microns um, in uh, diameter. Uh, these spindles, they're sometimes called spindles. Um, I've um, called them eopoikal effusa. Or I've used that name. Um, there's no formal description of these. Eopoikal fusor is a similar thing um, that was found in rather younger age uh, rocks, and it's been kind of a mystery 
um, what they what they were. Uh, and it's an interesting mystery because we do find these spindles um, in rocks going back 3.5 billion years, both um, in the Pilbara region of Western Australia, where Mount Grant is, and in the Barberton mountain land of South Africa. Um, Chris House um, did a wonderful study where he actually looked at the carbon isotopic composition of these. And he found they varied from 10 to um, minus 10 to minus 40 per mil. That's per thousand uh, in this measure of the carbon isotopic um, ratio. Um, this is really um, pretty um, extraordinary. A range of um, compositions um, to have in a single morphological type of, uh, of fossil. Um, I think that these are actinobacteria. Um, and they are sporangia. Actinobacteria are the prokaryotic version of fungi. Uh, they have hyphae, which are very, very narrow tubular uh, cells. Um, and then they reproduce with tiny spores that are produced in sporangia. Um, some classic actinobacteria are streptomyces, for example, from which we get um, um, strept streptomycin um, and other antibiotics. These are um, well-known um, antibiotic producing organisms are found largely in soil and uh, characteristically give that lovely soily smell, the rich loamy smell you get by looking at, um, at, at, uh, at, 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 at soil. Um, they're also uh, were rounded, um, uh, so it's a decomposer organism like a bacterium, uh, which is kind of interesting. Uh, in the same uh, assemblage we get these rounded uh, spheres, um, about 30 microns or so uh, in diameter. Um, this is called Archaeospheroides. Um, and Chris House did some analyses of the isotopic composition of these two. They're all around about 34 uh, per mil or per thousand in del 13 C. Um, in the isotopic ratio of the carbon um, isotopes. Um, this is a very interesting uh, kind of uh, ratio to have, um, minus uh, 34. Um, quite distinct from uh, that of cyanobacteria and of living plants, which generally are minus 25 to minus um, uh, 29 or so. Um, these uh, sorts of um, cells, um, probably uh, purple sulfur bacteria. Uh, like chromation, for example. Um, these are bacteria that produce sulfate. And you may remember that the gel paleosol has a barite and gypsum um, in it. Um, the um, archaeospheroides then, as if it were a purple sulfur bacteria, that's a photosynth it's an anaerobic um, photosynthetic bacteria. It is producing organic matter um, by oxidizing sulfur. So it is reducing carbon dioxide to make organic matter and in the process it is oxidizing sulfide um, in um, the soil to reduce sulfate, and the sulfate is accumulating in what appears to be um, a desert, uh, a desert soil. There are also some tiny little run of the dark ones. This is another form of Archaeospheroides. Um, and these are uh, quite, uh, quite tiny, uh, about half the size, 15 uh, microns or so. Archaeospheroides, and they have the very distinctive uh, isotopic composition of minus 44 uh, per mil, del 13C. Uh, um, Archaeospheroides, um, this is a very distinct, there's only a few organisms that do this, that make carbon that is so isotopically light, that's so extremely enriched in 12 carbon rather than 13 carbon, and these are methanogens. 
another anaerobic uh, bacterial family um, which produce uh, methane. Methanogen means uh, it produces uh, methane. Methanosarcana, there's a whole bunch of these. Um, this is very um, interesting um, and it suggests where the Eupoikilofusa could have gotten these very negative compositions. This was eating them, this was producing this light isotopic composition. This was eating a whole variety of different things, including these and, and others, and so it has a large range. Uh, because for a bacteria, an actinobacterium, uh, like a human, uh, like animals, um, you are what you eat, plus or minus a few uh, per mil. On the other hand, if you're making methane or you're making organic matter uh, by photosynthesis, you have a certain molecular machinery uh, that has a certain um, enzymatic fractionation of the isotopes to produce um, a particular uh, kind of uh, material. And then finally, there are framboids. These are pyrite framboids. Um, pyrite framboids are rounded balls of uh, pyrite that are made by microbes and particularly uh, sulfate reducing bacteria. This is an extraordinary deposit and quite a few of us have been pretty um, involved in trying to unravel its secrets. Um, her, 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 uh, Sugitani, House, um, uh, several of us have been very, very interested in trying to understand um, this uh, kind of um, assemblage. Um, and it, it, the, the way I see it, it's, it's got uh, sulfur cyclers, it's got sulfur reducers and sulfur oxidizers. So there's a complete sulfur cycle, it's a self-sustaining cycle. Um, it also has um, producers um, that are uh, producing organic matter and decomposes. You need all of these components of an active soil microbiome, and here it all is at 3 billion years before present. Perhaps as early as 3.5, because these guys go back at uh, 3.5, um, and so do these, um, but um, the details of whether they're in a soil or in the ocean have not yet been, um, not yet been unraveled. Um, now, the Pilbara region of Western Australia has, has been famous for many, many years um, because of the discoveries of Bill Schopf. Um, he found uh, these microfossil filaments, uh, five microns in diameter. This is primeval film. Um, and he found them in marine rocks. They're in the apex chert. Um, about 3.5 billion years ago. Um, I believe him. I think these are in marine rocks. Um, I've been to the site. I've, I've studied the geology uh, fairly extensively. Um, and unlike these others, uh, permineralized microfossils, these do appear to me to be redeposited uh, marine, uh, marine cherts. So at 3.5 billion years ago, 3 to 3.5, probably this sort of thing was on land, uh, a complicated community. Um, the assemblage that was in the ocean was rather more simple. Um, what drew uh, Bill Schopf to this area, at least initially, uh, was the rather simple sorts of um, stromatolites that are found in these same deposits. Uh, stromatolites that look uh, like a form called conophyton. We give these stromatolites names. Um, these are from the, um, the building up of um, individual layers by um, microbial mats of filamentous organisms um, like this. Now, he thought uh, for quite a number of years um, that these uh, filaments uh, that he found as microfossils were probably cyanobacteria. Uh, but I think that's pretty unlikely. You also get this filamentous form um, in uh, purple sulfur bacteria, which are photosynthetic anaerobic bacteria. Um, the reason I think it's unlikely there were cyanobacteria this old is because, uh, of course, we have that other evidence, which I talked about last time, from the paleosols, that the world was pretty reducing then. There wasn't much oxygen in the atmosphere. So the idea of a um, oxidizing microbiota in either the sea or on land at 3.5 billion years uh, seems to me to be pretty, uh, pretty unlikely. 
Um, we uh, so um, these um, kind of fight hunters were were found also in rocks of about the same age, three point five uh, billion years by um, Abby or, uh, by uh, well Alec Trendle first, uh, and then very convincingly studied uh, by um, Abby um, Allward as some of the oldest um, fossils that we uh, that we know. Um, there's a possibility of even older fossils though, and I, I talked a little bit um, about uh, about this. Um, there were, um, uh, reported by Nutman at, at Al, um, some um, rather chronicle looking things. Not quite right though, and there's been a bit of dispute about these. Um, these are um, uh, supposed stromatolites at um, Isukasia in uh, Greenland. 3.7 billion um, years old. Um, I've also studied a paleosol there. This is um, Ritalik and Nofke. Um, 2019. Um, and um, we had um, we had uh, a paleosol which we analyzed the organic. Com we don't have any microfossils on this paleosol. It's a schist. It's very highly um, altered, um, no silicified um, bacteria or anything like that. But we did get minus 27 per mil uh, del 13C um, out of it, uh, suggestive of uh, the kind of fractionation that you expect um, in a um, in a photosynthetic organism um, in a, in in a soil. Now. Um, there have also been studies um, by um, uh, a young lady by the name of Jokic of um, life in uh, stromatolites uh, in a baritic hot spring, uh, which they say is on land, but uh, it's in a hot spring. It's an aquatic assemblage, more like this than like this complicated uh, microbiome. Uh, um, so we're starting to be able to tell the difference between a hot spring in a continental setting um, and a um, and a marine uh, kind of a, um, assemblage of microbes. Now, um, the distinction is important, I think, as you'll see um, in a bit. I think it's quite relevant, uh, for example, uh, to studying uh, the origin of um, of life. Um, and then finally, um, a really Interesting fossil, uh, which now has its Wikipedia page, uh, is Discagma, uh, 2.2 uh, GA um, in uh, South Africa. It's in the top of the waterfall onda uh, paleosol, um, and it's a very interesting looking uh, fossil. It's kind of an urn shaped thing. And it's attached in a system of stolons. Uh, so there are several of these um, scattered over the surface of the paleosol uh, with the stolons, uh, the, uh, the connection going down. Uh, the thing is actually hollow here. Uh, and it has um, these hair-like things um, in um, a collar um, at, at the top. Uh, it's very small. This is one millimeter. But uh, nevertheless, megascopic. Um, at 2.2 billion years, we're after the Great Oxidation event. Um, my preferred uh, interpretation of this is that it is uh, related to geocyclone. This one is extinct. I'll put a dagger there. Um, geocyphone um, is a, a very strange um, vesicle like thing. Uh, usually clustered in the same way and attached uh, to with with hyphae. Oh, there are hyphae coming out the out the sides of these things too, um, and uh, geosiphon is similar. Uh, geosiphon is um, a symbiosis between a glomeromycotin fungus and um, a Gnostocalian 
cyanobacteria. So nostoc is basically pond scum, green pond scum, green pond scum. Nostoc is a, uh, a prokaryotic organism. The fungus, on the other hand, um, is a eukaryotic uh, organism. Geocyphon is a living eukaryotic fungus, which has a differentiated uh, nucleus. Um, this is a big step up um, in the evolution of life on a land to get uh, the first uh, eukaryote at around about 2.2 uh, uh, billion years uh, before, uh, before present. Now, um, there are um, other uh, lines of evidence besides um, organic uh, carbon isotopic uh, composition. Um, and these are weaker lines of evidence that we're not so worried about now that we're starting to get a little bit of biology. And this is what we hope to get um, on, on Mars eventually, some real microfossils, some real biological structure. Um, but we have evidence of these sorts of things already on Mars. Um, so if this is the, just the microfossils, let's go to trace fossils. Um, we can look, for example, at um, interesting um, structures um, that um, appear to be um, mini stromatolites. Um, in the three billion year old prepongola um, paleosol of South Africa, um, there are a class of um, quartz that have these uh, rather ferruginized coatings on top. Um, the whole thing is now an andalusite schist. Um, but um, these sorts of mini stromatolites are very similar uh, to um, rock varnish. Um, in the Martian uh, paleosol, um, 3.7 billion years old at the Gale Crater on Mars, uh, the surface has this vesicular structure. The vesicular structure is found in desert soils on Earth. And it's caused because in desert soils, they have mainly microfossils, of course, mainly microscopic organisms. And when it rains, uh, suddenly they all come alive and start respiring um, gases. Um, they respire uh, uh, CO2 like we do um, by eating up organic matter in the mud. Um, and that percolating gas um, creates a vesic vesic vesicular structure in the wet clay uh, from um, the um, uh, from the rainstorm. Um, we see this in the Martian soil. Um, I also found an example of this in some 1.7 billion year old uh, paleosols from um, uh, Hunan in China. Uh, so we have this in Mars. Uh, also have it at 1.7 uh, billion years old in uh, in China in some paleosols I've just recently described. So the trace fossil evidence is not to be um, dismissed. Um, there's also soil structure evidence. Soil structure evidence would include things like um, clay skins. I've seen them up to 3.5 billion years old um, in uh, some Pilbara paleosols. Uh, particularly the one associated with the apex, uh, apex chert. Um, I've seen them in lots of paleosols of other geological ages um, after that. Uh, blocky pads. Back to 2.2 billion years old in the waterfall under uh, paleosol. Uh, these kinds of ped structures and clay skins are commonly associated um, with the activity of the soil microbiome in modern soils. And finding them in the past is a um, another um, indication. Um, uh, low total organic carbon. Now this is kind of a conundrum, I suppose. But um, there is a lot of organic carbon in meteorites. 
um, particularly carbonaceous um, chondrites. Um, and there was a lot of uh, cometary organic carbon delivered to the early Earth. Um, in fact, um, paleosols, however, almost all paleosols, with the exception of coal seams, have very low total organic carbon. And that's because they were alive. That's because um, the, um, the carbon um, is um, very strongly depleted in a living ecosystem that has both producers and uh, consumers. It's pretty normal in paleosols going all the way back to 3.7 a billion years at Isocasia um, to have uh, organic carbon contents of less than um, a uh, less than a percent. We can look at trace elements. And the one that's most important is is potassium. Um, if we have a, a soil profile uh, in which we measure the uh, potassium abundance, and it is depleted toward the surface, um, that is an indication that that paleosol was um, alive. We found this in the Isocasia and in other examples. The reason is that uh, potassium comes from a mineral called apatite, uh, which is very stable um, under the action of normal acidic or hydrolytic uh, weathering. Um, to really get apatite to ye yield its phosphorus, um, we have to apply organic ligands. Even bacteria do this very, very effectively. Um, the uh, depletion of phosphorus within a soil profile, um, uh, it's just, it's the, so say the soil profile is only 40 centimeters or so thick here. Uh, if we notice this by analyzing for um, phosphorus, and it's generally not present in large amounts, this would be uh, two um, weight percent, um, we can infer that there was uh, life in uh, paleosol when we find this back to 3.7. And then finally, soil thickness. This is a really strange thing about Precambrian paleosols. Now, Stan Shum, many years ago, uh, proposed an interesting thought experiment, which, which I think is wrong, but is nevertheless um, useful. Uh, he proposed uh, that um, in the early Earth, um, the, uh, as soon as a mineral grain was weathered from a granite, it would be washed down um, into the basin, to the sedimentary basin. So we should have very thin soil profiles and relatively coarse grained um, sediments. But no, that's not what we find. What we find is some of these soils are three and four meters thick, mainly clay. What is holding this landscape together? Um, the answer in modern environments, of course, is forests. And even in desert environments, it's the soil crust. Life binds the soil together um, and um, creates a um, thick clay profile. Um, and this is what we see in the fossil record. It does look, to me, uh, from this rather anomalous thickness of many of these components that we're dealing um, with uh, a living soil uh, surface well back. Um, into um, Earth uh, history. Now, um, let me switch gears now. I think there's evidence for life well back, and I think we'll find um, evidence for life on Mars eventually. So far, it's just circumstantial, but if we could find microfossils and look at trying to infer their metabolism, it would be a lot stronger. Um, I think we can make a pretty good case uh, for the origin of life in soil. Um, we have several um, different um, lines of evidence for the origin of, uh, of life. Um, the building blocks of life are um, not a, a problem. Uh, there's a very famous experiment um, which um, looked at um, a kind of a, a microcosm of the early Earth um, and early atmosphere. Um, it was done by um, Stanley Miller. Uh, and Harold um, Urey, uh, the Urey Miller experiment. Um, they had an atmosphere here of ammonia. Uh, they had water here. They had a Bunsen burner here. 
to heat the whole thing up. They had a water trap here. This is a cooler because it tended to get kind of hot. Uh, they also had electrodes. That was lightning. Uh, so they have a, an ammonia and a methane, CH4, uh, atmosphere. Um, they knew oxygen wasn't going to be a part of it. CO2 as well. Um, there in this atmosphere, um, they heated it up and they found, um, this is the, the retort stand here, um, they found that after a few weeks or so, this brown sludge formed uh, in the reaction flask in this in their, this is their ocean, this is their atmosphere, um, and it had a whole bunch of complicated compounds in it. It had formaldehyde, it had amino acids, it had sugars. Um, it was just forming spontaneously. Um, it, what, what they formed was pretty much what you find in carbonaceous chondrites. Carbonaceous chondrites also have organic matter um, which is uh, rather sophisticated, including amino acids, sugars, formaldehyde, other simple uh, compounds. Um, the difference between um, carbonaceous chondrites and the Uramilla uh, experiment is actually none at all. It's the same thing. Uh, and furthermore, um, each handed version of a molecule, like we have left-handed uh, amino acids, generally speaking, came in equal numbers of left-handed and right-handed versions. Um, there was no, unlike life itself, which produces a particular handedness for a particular compound, just as you would um, if you needed to have a particular function. Now, a Uri Miller experiment was done in 1951, the year of my birth. Um, these carbonaceous chondrites are 4.5 billion years old. They go well back to the beginning of um, the uh, of the of the universe. The big question for the origin of life then is not how you make complicated organic compounds. That seems to be spontaneous. Um, it's getting to life. Getting to an organized structure of um, rather amazing complexity. Um, the um, it's kind of a miracle. Uh, the odds of going from this kind of organic tarry gunk to even something as simple as um, an Escherichia, a, a coli cell, um, are estimated to be like one in the number of electrons in the visible uh, universe. A pretty long um, odds. Um, carbonaceous chondrites eventually ended up as fossil um, microbes. Which I've just talked about, 3.5 billion years. So we have about a bill. We have about a uh, hundred billion years here, about a billion years or so uh, between um, the formation of the early Earth and the solar system, with this uh, sort of uh, general uh, materials, and something as organized as a microfossil that had a particular carbon isotopic composition and a particular inferred metabolic uh, pathway, because organisms have to have these these different sorts of things. Um, so here's the here's here's the business here. Um, in the origin of life, it's basically what Jacques Monod, a famous French molecular uh, biologist, said. It's chance versus necessity. Could it happen by chance? Well, maybe. Not much time, really, um, for it to happen by chance. Um, but evolution does not proceed by chance. Uh, evolution proceeds by necessity, by natural selection, by having a certain sort of of uh, material um, in the right place at the right time so that it can uh, persist, so that it can evolve. Um, there's a question, of course, of how you define life. Um, uh, NASA has adopted a, a, a definition of life is uh, something that's capable of Darwinian evolution, capable of um, evolution by natural selection. I like that um, explanation, but life also, of course, has to, has to have um, a metabolism. It has to have something to do, um, and it has to um, be able to reproduce itself as well. Um, it doesn't have to do those things well to start with, but it has to have some elements of that um, and elements of um, becoming uh, a dominant in an ancient uh, in an ancient world. Well, there is there are three basic um, areas. Um, in, um, in which uh, we think um, life evolved. 
um, some people uh, like the idea that life evolved uh, in the sea. Um, that uh, is a very old idea, it goes back to the ancient Greeks, and if you've been looking in tide pools in the Oregon coast or are familiar with marine biology, it's pretty amazing, um, actually, um, how um, extraordinary uh, life is there. Um, one problem, uh, this was Darwin's idea too, he had the idea that life evolved in some warm little pond. Uh, and he went to a little pond because the biggest problem with the sea uh, is that when you start forming complicated compounds, they just dissolve back in again. It's an extended solution in which it's very hard to maintain complex organic molecules without them being destroyed. Um, Darwin had in mind a, a, a small pond, I suppose about the size of a, a bowl of soup. Um, it turns out that um, to really do effective biosynthesis of this sort, um, even this is too big, uh, you need to have something that's even smaller, about the size of a cell, about 30 microns or so. Volcanic vents have been a favorite um, uh, idea uh, for the origin of life, as a source for the origin of, um, of life, uh, particularly the black smokers that were discovered um, um, off, the, off the Oregon coast um, in uh, 1974 by Jack Corliss, and he uh, championed this idea uh, that these were where life evolved, um, in particular because the, the vent chimneys themselves, um, the, the vent is not too good a place uh, for uh, the evolution of life. But this rather um, porous uh, chimney of pyrite and other minerals um, has a lot of tiny little spaces which could be uh, useful. Um, reaction uh, chambers. Uh, these vents, of course, are in the deep sea. Um, they are um, away from the sun um, and uh, normal sources of energy uh, for, uh, for life, but are nevertheless an interesting uh, possibility. And then finally, there's soils. Um, if these uh, porous materials of a black smoker chimney are a possibility uh, for reaction chambers, what about soils? I think soils are probably worth considering as a place for the origin of life um, as well. I should add in for a volcanic vent, not too cheery in the vent itself. Um, this is something that Jack Corliss made quite uh, plain from the very beginning. 300 degrees centigrade and a pH of 2. Um, not great for life. Um, that would destroy uh, life as it uh, actually um, developed. Um, so what we have to do is find a, find a place that can make uh, a kind of metabolism that can um, perpetuate really complicated molecules like DNA and RNA, these superbly long uh, uh, polymers that are essential uh, for the kind of reproduction uh, that modern life uh, depends on. Now, another way to look at the problem is uh, clays. Um, did they have a role in the origin of life? Well, many people think so. Um, and um, many people think that clays are important for a variety of um, reasons. Uh, they absorb organic matter. Smectite clays, for example, uh, absorb organic matter really quite nicely. They pick up spills of, um, of oil. Um, um, we find um, also that they also uh, aid organic matter synthesis. Now, um, this experiment of um, the Uri Miller experiment has been done many, many times. Um, it's been done with different atmospheres. Um, you can you can throw away the methane and the ammonia and just do it with carbon dioxide. The result is the same. You just get lower yields. But if you add clay to the fluid here, well, the yields just go through the roof. Um, it really helps to make organic matter if you have some clays present. Actually, almost all minerals help. Olivine helps too. Um, quartz, not so much. Um, there are varied effects of varied minerals uh, in this kind of experiment. We don't quite know how it helps. Um, one idea is that uh, clay is a catalyst. Meaning that the clay uh, participates in an, in an irreversible reaction 
with the organic matter precursors um, that uh, then allows them to bind up together more uh, quickly. Uh, it could be that clays are a template because clays have a complicated structure and um, they could align the reaction components, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, whatever, um, in a certain order which makes them preferentially combine to make the organic um, matter. Uh, or they could be a chemostat. Um, it could be that clays are very good at maintaining a particular kind of pH or EH level um, in the soil uh, or in other uh, environments. So that if it gets a little bit too acidic, the clays dissolve and then bring it back to equilibrium. A kind of chemostat could be important in the sort of environment where you're making long, delicate organic uh, compounds. Clays also form compartments. Um, so clays tend to have negative charges on their faces and positive at the end. And so um, those will line up to form a kind of a house of cards structure. This house of cards structure, if you've got lots of clay minerals, and we're talking tiny things here, the clay minerals are less than two microns um, in size. This is two microns. Um, we, are find, we are forming a complicated cornflake-like structure or house of cards structure. Um, that uh, is creating a kind of a chemical lab. Um, energy storage. Celia Coyne did a very interesting experiment where she looked at hydrazine fracking of clay. And she found uh, that if you use this uh, well-known surfractant, meaning a, a very penetrative um, fluid um, in clays, you can actually um, release heat and light energy. So clays are kind of like a battery. There's energy um, within them. Uh, and then finally, information storage. Now this is um, an odd concept um, that is not yet proven. Uh, the idea is of a crystal gene. Could clay mineral stacks be a form of um, gene? So um, you can imagine clays are layer minerals. Um, if you have a different order, like a barcode, of different compositions of clay layers, uh, could that be replicated as a form of information transfer? Or alternatively, could um, ions, particularly large ions, like odd things like manganese and others uh, in the surface, um, be a, a kind of a genetic uh, marker that would code for things, for example, like the swelling behavior of clay, how rapidly it swells when it's wet uh, and how much it shrinks when it's dry. Uh, could there be a kind of an idea of a genetic uh, crystal? Uh, this is an idea that's been suggested uh, but uh, so far not validated by any um, actual experimental evidence. Although people have tried, uh, it turns out that it's a very, um, a very difficult uh, problem. Um, there's also a role for iron minerals in the origin of life. Um, iron minerals are also very effective in the Uri Miller experiment. Um, Um, there are several um, sorts of um, iron minerals that uh, form compartments. Or if you prefer, test tubes. Um, for example, um, elongate tubes of um, acaganei. Um, or um, hexagonal plates of uh, hematite or um, balls of uh, ferrihydrite, hollow balls. Iron minerals can form compartments just as clays can. And these could be important for 
um, isolating reaction just like the test tube in a, in, in a chem lab. And then uh, finally, um, there is um, redox reactions. Um, iron, of course, comes in two different redox states, uh, Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus. Um, and um, it's been suggested, for example, uh, that um, we could um, turn out, we could have um, siderite uh, with iron in the reduced state, FeCO3, uh, uh, being oxidized to um, gertine. Um, FeOOH, uh, in which iron is in the oxidized state, um, uh, by photooxidation with UV uh, radiation, um, the um, iron uh, in the satellite is oxidized and combines with oxygen in the atmosphere, giving off CO2 um, by excitation with UV uh, light uh, to uh, produce from uh, CO2 in the soil or in the air, um, reduced organic compounds like formate or formaldehyde. Um, these sorts of experiments have been done, uh, showing uh, that um, it is possible to envisage at least an abiotic form of photosynthesis. This is actually photosynthesis. What's happening here is the um, the reduction of iron is coupled with the, 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 the oxidation of iron is coupled with the reduction of carbon dioxide uh, to form uh, more complicated organic compounds. It's a kind of photosynthesis, a very crude and ineffective and poorly regulated form of um, photo, uh, photosynthesis. Now, why do I mention all this? Uh, it's because uh, soils are, of course, um, the place where all this is happening. Soils are the main place where clays are forming. Uh, soils are um, a very uh, porous uh, medium at the surface of the earth, at the zone of uh, materials and um, energy transfer. Um, soils are, I think, um, a rather remarkably suitable place uh, for the origin of life. They don't have the dissolution problems of the ocean um, or the high temperature low pH problem of uh, the deep sea uh, vents. Uh, can I prove it? No, but I can tell you a story. Uh, I'll tell you a story uh, about the, the sorry story of um, sloppy, sticky, tough, and lumpy. Uh, let's imagine um, that we're in the early stages of uh, Earth evolution. The sun has turned on. Um, there's rain. Uh, there's wind, and we have a whole bunch of grains uh, at the surface of the planetary soil. Um, and these are weathering. They're weathering by uh, hydrolysis reactions. We have a, an atmosphere largely of CO2, not too much oxygen um, in it. Um, let's imagine we form a kind of a clay um, which is uh, a clay we'll call tough. You can imagine this would be something like a kaolinite. I'm going to call it tough. Um, uh, a tough clay would be a clay that has very low shrink swell behavior uh, and uh, eventually coats the grain from which it's weathering to the point where it can't uh, actually form um, any, any more clay. The opposite extreme would be a clay that is so easily wet and dissolves in water so rapidly, we'll call that one sloppy. Um, this would be something like a smectite uh, clay, a shrink swell clay. Um, it forms and then it gets washed down with water um, into the soil uh, profile. The clays that are really interesting in this situation are the ones that form up near the surface and that expand when it's wet, when the weathering is going on, um, enough to bridge the gap. And then when it dries out, they crack away from the grain to expose more of it uh, so that they can um, 
they can form more clay. We'll call this clay sticky. It would be another smectite, a smectite with a different shrink swell behavior than uh, than sloppy. Um, and this one here we'll call um, we'll call uh, lumpy. Another smectite. This is a very interesting situation because the clays in these situations, which have just the right shrink swell behavior to bridge the gap between the grains uh, and to pull away from the grains when they dry out again, uh, these are um, in an evolutionary race. They are naturally selected by the soil. There are forces of destruction here, wind and rain, that we should tear this whole thing out. But the more clay that is formed, uh, in this soil, particularly up near the surface, the more this soil will persist to form more clay. It's a positive reinforcement kind of a mechanism for soil stabilization. Um, it's kind of like a selfish soil. The soil itself um, is persisting in the zone of energy uh, transfer and materials, uh, CO2, is needed for the weathering um, and is um, thus able to um, make more complicated chemical reactions. Now, not only does the soil contain um, clay, um, it also uh, contains um, water. And the water is in menisci between the grains when it's dried out. Um, the whole thing is flush with water when it rains heavily. Um, it gets a little waterlogged even. Uh, but these uh, these menisci of uh, water are now um, really amazing reaction centers uh, for the kinds of reactions we see um, with the Uri Miller synthesis reactions. Uh, these uh, little um, menisci of uh, water left at matrix potential when the soil dries out after a rain are uh, now creating organic uh, compounds. They're creating large molecular weight organic compounds which persist during the desiccation phase and then are not dissolved again uh, when uh, the water becomes um, too uh, abundant in the soil after another um, rainstorm. Um, these uh, tarry materials further will stabilize the soil against uh, erosion. Uh, just like putting tar on a cornfield or molasses on a cornfield, um, we can stabilize the soil uh, from, um, from erosion. Um, we can imagine a situation um, here then um, where pretty quickly um, with uh, uramilla organic synthesis, with clay formation, um, you are up to a stage of a carbonaceous chondrite soil. which we know uh, happened in the solar system at about 4.5 billion years on lots of planetismals, probably also including Earth, although that phase in Earth's development has long been um, destroyed. These carbonaceous chondrite soils would have been ubiquitous because all the other areas of the, of the planet would be torn up by erosion, by wind erosion and by uh, flooding and other um, events. Uh, so um, this um, soil stabilization becomes a self-reinforcing phenomenon where you get a soil that's very rich in uh, clay and organic matter. Now the next steps of course are magic. Um, we don't really know all the details, but some of these um, lipids, some of these complicated organic molecules may have folded in to be able to make cell walls and enclose more complicated uh, machinery. Uh, and we can see this as the this is the early, rather primitive clay life phase uh, in the evolution of life, which has continued to thrive pretty much by virtue of exploiting the soil and of stabilizing uh, the soil. As seems pretty clear with human abuse of soils through agricultural plowing and other effects, um, we live and die on this planet by the bounty provided by the soil. We need to save our soils to save our, uh, our souls. Um, and it could be uh, that this uh, is a 
mechanism uh, for the origin of life. What it does for you in particular is it provides you with a lot of um, complicated organic compounds in a concentrated form associated with both clays and iron minerals in a fashion um, that is very promising for the assembly of the amazingly complicated biological uh, mechanisms. Uh, in terms of the um, Darwinian view of life, this is this is kind of a it's kind of a proto life. Uh, so uh, on on the early planetesimal for the beginnings of a of a carbonaceous uh, chondrite soil, um, the soils will start with um, uh, um, an impact and um, the deposition of uh, a material. Um, that material will then develop through time. Um, a thick clay profile um, with um, some uh, maybe salt minerals of some sort. Um, this is now uh, a young soil. This is now a mature soil, um, which is clay and now firmly established against the forces of erosion. Um, it can, um, of course, um, bits of it can be uh, blown away bits of this clay material to seed other uh, soils uh, in the same area. This is reproduction by crystal genes or by just physical seeding of that clay material. And then um, the whole thing is just covered up uh, by another, uh, another impact. Another impact here. These are the crystals. Here's the clay. Uh, this is death. Uh, the metabolism in this particular case is hydrolysis. It's the weathering of the minerals, olivines and pyroxene on the early earth, um, and uh, feldspars, of course, uh, to make clay. That's the, that's the metabolism, um, and they're separated out as, uh, as salts in the soil. Um, it has a reproduction, and it has uh, death. Uh, the soils have, um, in a very primitive and crude form, um, many aspects of um, living uh, creatures, and uh, I think it's pretty likely um, that the world as we know it now evolved in uh, such soils, either here or on Mars. Maybe they form, maybe life formed on Mars and was transported back to Earth, uh, like some meteorites that we've found. Anyway, still an open question uh, and fascinating to uh, contemplate. So thanks for your attention.